Hi, this is Walt Wheeler, Executive Director of the Michigan Masonic Charitable Foundation. And we're here today recording another in our legacy series, interviews of past Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge of Michigan. With us here today is Most Worshipful Brother Iris Laban, who served as Grand Master in the years 2007-2008. Ira, welcome. Nice to have you with us here today. Good being here today. We're going to start at the very beginning. Tell us where you were born. I was born in Taylor Township at that time, before it was a city, and, uh, in 1942, in the, uh, in the back bedroom of my, my parents' home. Oh, okay. And the doctor that came out to uh, deliver me was Dr. Sherman. And that's, they named me Ira Sherman because of that doctor. Very good. So tell me a little bit about your mom and dad. My uh, mom was originally from uh, southwestern Indiana, uh, a little town called Edwardsport, and uh, she was from a uh, farming community, and her dad was uh, a farmer, and uh, she was one of four children, and um, she uh, often talked about uh, walking to school and freezing her feet because they, they didn't have uh, uh, shoes. Uh, for you know, until they needed him in wintertime, and uh, it was cold enough that she froze her feet and dropped out of school when she was in seventh grade. And after which, she uh, talked about uh, working in the in the fields of the farm behind a team of horses. So she was a very hardworking woman, and uh, she uh, and my dad was uh, originally he was born in Oneida, Tennessee. Uh, he was one of twelve children. And uh, I believe he was the third of 12. And uh, his, uh, uh, his, his father, my great-grandfather, owned a hardware in, in Oneida, along with his brother-in-law. Well, my, uh, my dad uh, and uh, my dad's family moved to Kansas from there. But my uncle Ira, for whom I'm named, was born in Cawker City, Kansas. And I often wondered why they moved to Kansas, and uh, it came down to a, uh, my great-grandfather being shot off the horse by his brother-in-law, and my, great and my grandfather killed my uncle, and so they had to leave town. And that's the reason they moved to Kansas. So then they moved eventually to southern Indiana, and uh, my uh, grandfather was a moonshiner, basically as well as being a farmer, but. Uh, uh, my dad would talk about uh, hiding the, the different parts of the still in a certain row, row of corn, and uh, and uh, they uh, so it was you know, interesting to, to hear those old stories. And uh, when my mom and dad first came to Michigan, they they all, they both played string instruments, and uh, my uncle Ira lived next door to us, and my his his wife Aunt Kathleen, and uh, they had a foursome there, and they played for most of the square dances all the downriver uh, Detroit area. And uh, I just wish we had gotten some recordings then, because uh, you know we have nothing on tape or anything to to uh, play from that that era. I miss that. What were mom and dad's names? My mom was Ruby, and uh, my dad was A Y, initials only. Oh, really? The first three the first three uh, boys, my uncle uh, the oldest uh, was uh, A B, and my dad was A Y. And my Uncle Ira was R.L. R.L. changed his name to Ira, and A.B. changed his name to Absalom. But my dad never changed his name. And thinking of that, when I was in the when I was in the fourth or fifth grade, the teacher says, "Ira, I need to have your dad's name. All you have is initials." And I says, "His name is A.Y. That's all there is." She sent me to the principal's office. And I got expelled from school because I wouldn't give my dad's name. So my dad brought me back to school the next day, and he says, my name is A. You spell it A-Y. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> so it was kind of funny in a way. But that's, that's what he was named. And it was, I guess it was common back then for the Southern families to, to name their, <clears throat> excuse me, to name their, their children, uh, initials only. So why did they come to Michigan then? Because your uncle was already here, or um, my aunt had moved up here first, the the oldest girl, and uh, 
she uh, moved up here and and had a place in Detroit on Reeder Street. And uh, they, uh, my mom and dad moved up here because of the Depression. And uh, there was jobs available up here, and my dad went to work for McCloth Steel. And then my uncle Ira came up, and he started working at McCloth Steel. And then they had a further problem. They went back to the farm for a while, and then they came back. And uh, uh, that was in 1936. They, uh, my dad and my uncle came out to Taylor and they and my and my uh, aunt and they bought acreage three acres in a row on Mary Street and Taylor and built their homes there and uh, the uh, my dad and mom's uh, home is still in the in the family and my uncle's is in his granddaughter owns it and the next the next one is sold to somebody else but uh, you know, the, the house still stands there, and uh, my my brother and I own it now. Okay, well, you, you mentioned a brother. Do you have any siblings, obviously? Yes, I'm one of six children. Uh, my oldest brother, uh, Larry, was uh, also a member of the lodge, and uh, my uh, and I'm, I have a sister, one sister, and uh, I'm the third child, and then I have uh, uh, three younger brothers, uh, one of which is deceased. Okay. So you grew up in Taylor. Where did you go to school? Went to school at beginning at Taylor Center Elementary and uh, went there through the third grade. And then uh, they decided to change the boundary line for the schools. And once again, Dad came to the, to the rescue and he, uh, they wouldn't pick me up in front of the house, but yet the school, the school bus for the school I had been going to came right by the house. So he insisted that I go to that school, and he told me, get on that bus. So every day that I would go to that school, you're not supposed to be here. And they would transport me to the other school. And then they would let me off like like half a mile away from the house. So my dad finally went to the school and, and said, you know, you've got buses going right by the house. And so they changed the routing and changed the, changed the district line, but I went to the new school anyway. So that was Edgewood School, and then, uh, then went back to Taylor Center because they changed the boundary again. And uh, then from there I went to Taylor Center High School and uh, graduated from Taylor Center High School in 1960. And uh, then, uh, you know, that's uh, my, my elementary and high school. And uh, then, uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, you know, that, that school has since been torn down. Okay. So do you have any uh, vivid childhood memories, anything you recall? I'm sure there are some things, but some uh, things that stand out? Well, there's a lot of things that stand out, but I just, uh, uh, I'd have to say uh, the, uh, the, the, the I can, one of the most vivid things I remember is we lived on Mary Street off Telegraph, and <clears throat> during the springtime, uh, Dad would try to get down the road, and uh, everybody would have end up having to park on Telegraph Road because the the their, our street was just all mud. And uh, but they, you know, my mom and dad had moved out there and cleared the land, and and uh, built their house and you know developed everything, the garden, the house, everything. So it's uh, quite you know quite. Uh, vivid in my memory to see the developmental stages of the area year to year to year and era to era. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, back then Telegraph Road was a two-lane highway. And uh, now it's a uh, six-lane divided highway. Yep. So, but, uh, you know, that was the strip along Telegraph there was uh, most vivid because I used to walk down to the corner store and get a pop and uh, it was uh, you know, not that way anymore. No, certainly not. So did, when you were in high school, did you participate in any extracurricular activities, bands, sports? Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I participated in band. Okay. And uh, I started out, I uh, thought I wanted to play the trumpet, and uh, uh, I get to school and you know, go out for band, and geez, everybody wants to play trumpet. And so the band director started talking to us, and he talked me into playing the French horn. And so I played, uh, started on the French horn and, and 
practiced and practiced and ended up sitting first chair French horn for four years. And uh, we started at that time, they, they had moved the eighth grade to the high school setting. And uh, so from the eighth through the twelfth, I was at the high school. And uh, we started in band in the eighth grade. And uh, we had a new, brand, new band director uh, when I was in the ninth grade and all new uniforms and, and just uh, really, uh, he was a graduate of University of Michigan and, and uh, the high stepping and, and uh, so we, we participated in a lot of, a lot of events and uh, traveled widely and, and uh, because I played the horn, uh, even, even performed at, at various churches as a, as a uh, four, four piece uh, brass ensemble. Okay. So that was quite, uh, quite unique. You still play at all? No. Not in no. So after high school, I know you served in the U.S. Air Force. Did you go immediately from school into the Air Force? or No, I went uh, to Henry Ford College Okay. Uh, for a couple of years. And then uh, I decided uh, uh, I wanted to go in the Air Force and see the world. And uh, I went into the United States Air Force, went to Lackland Air Force Base, served my basic training. But I made the big mistake of joining the 1st of July. And when I got down there, I, th I was like walking into a furnace. And uh, it, uh, it was uh, quite an experience with that kind of heat and the, the, the flag system that they have there. They have the red flag. If you, if you have a combination of humidity and temperature that totaled 180, you didn't go outside. And, uh, but our, our, our GI didn't much pay attention to that. <laughs> we still went out and ran. And uh, serving, you know, serving KP at the hospital, uh, that was a, you know, and pouring 50 pounds of potatoes in a potato peeling machine and, and uh, you know, those experiences you never forget. But. Uh, Where else were you stationed? Well, as I said, I wanted to join the Air Force and see the world and I, get, I got my orders and it says, I'm going to KI, KI saw your Air Force Base, Michigan. I said, they're sending me back to Michigan. And the day I left Texas, it was 115 degrees at the airport. The next morning when I got in Detroit, it was 55. And I like to froze. But then my duty station was out my, outside of Marquette. And so I flew to Marquette and took the bus and driving through the forest up there and all of a sudden you see a tail wing of a B-52 or a KC-135 and, and uh, wow, this big clearing in the middle of the woods. And uh, so I served there until K.I. Sawyer went uh, from uh, Air Defense Command to Strategic Air Command and they transferred me over to Kinchlow, which was at Sault Ste. Marie. Yep. So another duty station on the other side of the UP, and uh, I served there until finished out my term there. So I yeah, volunteered for everything, stayed in Michigan. So what was your classification, or what did you do? I was personnel specialist, and uh, I handled uh, the base military suggestion program for a good while, and then I was transferred to officer assignments. And I had, uh, at that time, I had a top secret crypto clearance. And I worked, uh, aside, beside that, I worked in, in the base communication center as a, uh, as a side, side uh, AFSC, Air Force Specialty Code. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the work. I got, uh, uh, you, know, you, you transfer people uh, because you have to, but also you had humanitarian uh, uh, reasons to transfer for uh, family illness and various things. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of the officers and, and uh, you know, basically just, uh, you know, it became enjoyable to me because you're helping people in, in, uh, in their endeavors. Mm -hmm. So after your service in the military, you went back to Taylor? Back to Taylor and... Uh, Finished school? En enrolled in, in school. Okay. And uh, I was working... Uh, Back at Henry Ford, I went back to Henry Ford. Okay, and um, <clears throat> went to school. Went to school there, and uh, was uh, studying to be a mortuary, you know, mortuary science 
I was studying to be a mortician. And uh, what made you pick that field? Well, my dad told me. He says, "You know, I, I, I think you should you'd make a good mortician," and that kind of put it in my mind. And so, I, I worked there for uh, good good year or two, and and uh, then we had five children's funerals in two weeks. And uh, about that same time, I was also working a, a part-time job with Taylor Ambulance. And uh, one of the guys at Taylor Ambulance said uh, he was going to take the, the test for the fire department. And he, was gonna, he wouldn't be around there much longer. I said, well, geez, maybe I'll go and I'll beat you. And uh, when the test results came out, I was top on the list and he didn't pass. So needless to say, he didn't talk to me for a while. <laughs> but uh, I uh, had the opportunity to get on the fire department and uh, with what had happened with the funeral service and, and the, uh, the heartache it caused me, uh, I, I would grieve with the parents. And uh, I uh, decided to go you know, take the job on the fire department and uh, it uh, proved to be a very uh, rewarding experience because you're, you're helping people in their most dire time of need. Yep. Same thing with the funeral service, but in a different, you know, different, right. different, uh, big difference there. So let, let's back up in time a little bit. <clears throat> what was your very first job? Do you remember? My very first job was uh, probably raking leaves and cutting grass for the neighbors, okay. and uh, you know, do what you can. You know, and uh, there was an older couple, a couple doors away, and uh, he would, he asked me to cut his grass for him, and I, I cut his grass and uh, raked his leaves and. Uh, Remember what you got paid for doing that? Uh, Twenty dollars a day, if that. Wow. He was generous. Twenty dollars a day is pretty good yeah, back then. Was, well, I worked from, you know, nine o'clock in the morning until until six o'clock. Worked all day, and okay. uh, he had he had a full acre of property, and he wanted it looking immaculate, and uh, I, I worked hard. So, what'd you move into from there? From what uh, was your next job? My next job was uh, I ended up getting a part-time job at uh, Telwick Motel. Uh, washing windows, washing walls, helping make the beds, you know, anything that needed to be done. Um, my pay was 35 cents an hour. And uh, I remember, remember 35 cents an hour. I thought, wow, that's. And they took taxes out of that. Yep. So that was, you know, even, even with the funeral job, uh, my, when I first started as an as a, uh, apprentice, I was making $35 a week. And back in that time, I bought a car working, making that wage. So it just, you know, a new, a new Bonneville convertible back then was $3,500. And uh, it just, you know, doesn't seem, doesn't seem quite right now that they're, you know, cars are, you know, cost so much, but yep. such are times. Yes, they are. So after uh, you got into the fire department, you had a pretty long career with the fire department. Yep. Um, but I want to I back up a little bit because I know before you started the fire department, you met a young lady named Gail. And why don't you tell us how you met Gail? In 1965, we had a snowstorm. I believe it was 23 inches of snow. And there was cars abandoned in the streets. And I, at that time, I was working for Taylor Ambulance. And... Uh, we, we were the only ambulance getting through. But we would go out to a, to a, a, a scene for the, you know, to meet the fire department or police department at a, at a home in the Taylor, and the neighbors literally would go out and push the ambulance down the road through the snow. So we'd get to the house, and load up the patient, and then they'd push us out to, the, to a main road and uh, go in, went into Oakwood Hospital, and uh, we had picked up a DOA, and the body was in the back of the ambulance. And then they called us and says, can you pick up a setup patient who's about to deliver a baby? So we had a life and death in the same ambulance and pulled in at Oakwood Emergency. And there was this nurse's aide there that uh, came out. I was making up the stretcher afterwards. And uh, she made a comment about us bringing in two patients. And one went to the morgue, one, one went to the, you know, it was like, was like life expiring and, and new life. Yep. And uh, so I, I kind of flirted with her, and she says, uh, 
what would your wife say if she knew you were talking to me? And I said, well, if I had a wife, she would probably be upset. <laughs> and uh, the next time I, I come in, I was looking for her, and she was off. And one of the nurses says, yeah, she was looking for you to come in. She wanted to talk to you again. So about a day or two later, I see her again, and uh, I ask her out. And we started dating, and that was in 1965. And uh, then she started nurses training. And uh, I, uh, we were going together, and she became a nurse, and we got married in 1968. 1968. And you guys have five children. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your children? Well, we have uh, uh, my oldest son is Joseph. And uh, Joseph, uh, when he was in the seventh grade, I told all my kids, try to get an you know, idea of what you want to do in life. And uh, told him that one day and a couple of days later I'm working in the garage and he comes in and he says, Dad, I've decided what I wanted to do and I looked at him like, huh? I, and then he reminded me what I said and I said, oh, okay. And I figured, okay, he's going to say, I want to be a fireman. And he says, uh, I've decided I want to uh, be an attorney and specialize in representing the hearing impaired people. And I just got cold chills down my back. And I thought, wow, is that, is that, that's out of the box. And, uh, but he had been, one of his best buddies was Gary Johnson, and Gary's parents were both uh, speech and hearing impaired. And uh, they, uh, they even had a t typewriter type machine with a red light on it uh, for when the phone rang, because they couldn't, they couldn't speak mm -hmm. or, or hear. And uh, he, he had learned quite a bit of sign language from them and uh, where, where he was going to school at the time was uh, they had even taught sign language to a song. And uh, so they would put uh, white gloves on, they'd use black light and, and do the sign language song. And it's quite unique. Uh, Joe uh, graduated from uh, University of Michigan with, uh, with honors. He had a 3.79 grade point average with a degree in psychology and sociology. And uh, so he had a pre-med as, as well as a pre-law. And uh, he is currently professor of law at University of Detroit School of Law. Excellent. As well as doing bar exam, you know, appeals and uh, regular cases. You know, he has his regular practice in addition to that. And um, then my oldest daughter graduated from University of Michigan. And uh, she has a business degree. And uh, she... Uh, Started out working with AAA and Livonia, and then progressed from there to Down River Community Conference, and then now she's working for Southeast Michigan Community Alliance, and she is the chief financial officer of of her her company. And, and her name is her name is Judith. Judith, okay. And uh, Judith uh, is uh, uh, very happy with her job as chief financial officer, and. Uh, then we have Joanna, which is my third daughter, my third child, and uh, Joanna is uh, uh, manager of a Bath and Body Works in Canton, and uh, loves her job very much. And uh, then we have uh, we were going to have four children, and uh, they found out uh, we had a bonus. Uh, we had twins. And so we had a boy-girl set of twins, they're six minutes apart, and Jason and Jessica. Jason currently works at ABC Building Products, which is a nationwide largest roofing supplier in the world. And uh, he's the uh, in charge of inside sales and uh, takes care of all the deliveries, a lot of different things in, in the office. And uh, Jessica works for uh, Wallside Windows and uh, as, as a, uh, on the production line there. Which one's older? Jason's older. Jason's older. Yeah, All right. Six minutes. Very good. I know that you have a lot of uh, grandchildren. Why don't you tell us a little bit yeah. about your grandchildren? And, and I understand you have a new great grandchild. Yes, yes. I have. Uh, we have eight grandchildren. Um, Tyler is the oldest. He's uh, twenty, and uh, he has a, a two-year-old, and Macy, and. Uh, She's a, she's a real handful. And uh, 
you you re start re you start realizing your age when the little toddlers come around and start getting into everything when you have when you're not used to having kids around and uh, but I have uh, Tyler Connor and Tyler Connor and Abby from Joe and then uh, from uh, Judy is uh, Elizabeth and Elena and then uh, Joanna has uh, three as uh, Colin Madison and uh, can't remember the last one's name uh, uh, can't remember. it'll come to you drill blank but uh, uh, Ashlyn Ashlyn okay but uh, they uh, they just you know when when you have even four to six of them over at once it's just like a madhouse there and I'm thinking geez how did we manage how do we manage feeding five of the seven of us there all the time and uh, you know we made it made it you know very very well and uh, but I, I've always, you know, tried to bring them up in a, in a uh, going to church every Sunday and, and uh, maintaining uh, the uh, uh, discipline as well as, as uh, uh, teaching uh, as much as you can about, about life, about everything around them. And uh, it wasn't until many years later when Joe started at University of Michigan, he came to me one day and he says, Dad, I want to thank you for what you give us. What do you mean? He says, I never realized how much the the education that you that you gave us, how much that meant until I get into college and start competing with other other students in college. And uh, geez, it makes you makes you kind of stand tall and, and yep. you know, thank God. You know, I might have done something right. Yep. Yes. Well, you had mentioned that uh, you got a job with the Taylor Fire Department, and I know you spent uh, several years with them. Why don't you tell us a little bit about being on the fire department? Well, the fire department uh, back then was, uh, you know, you, you, get, you get training sessions here and there, and, and, uh, but for the most part, back then, it was uh, you get the job and you learn from on-the-job experience. And it's always um, a buddy system, and uh, you're always you know, with another, another firefighter, and... Uh, you, you never leave the side of that firefighter, and uh, you're, uh, you, if he if he falls, you 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 help him up and you help him out if if necessary, and vice versa. It uh, very rewarding experience in that uh, you, know, you go out to a scene of a of a home and, and you've got a a baby that's choking on something and it's already turned blue, and uh, you know you, you you work with that that baby and you get him breathing again. And, Rush them to the hospital, and and uh, you know the baby's fine, and and uh, you know the, those those tearful parents are, are there, and and they're just shaking your hand and hugging you because you you know you saved mm -hmm. their their child. Um, you get uh, to the scene, and, and and in other cases though, where they've had a heart attack, and you can't save them, and all you can do is try to you know bring comfort to the to the people there, and uh, it's a uh, you go to a house fire and, and uh, you find out everybody's out of the house and you put the fire out and uh, it's, uh, you, you save them in their most dire time of need. And it's a, it's a rewarding feeling. It's very rewarding in that, in that you're, you're there and you're the first responders. And uh, you save life, you save, you know, save their property and, and it just, it's hard to explain to somebody who's never experienced it. Mm -hmm. But it's just, uh, you know, just extremely rewarding. How long were you with the fire department? I, I was hired in 1966 and formally retired in 1996. But I was I was off early because of, of uh, I slipped at a fire and, and uh, ruptured a disc. Mm -hmm. So after the second back surgery, they they forced me off on a medical disability, and then yeah. You know, but uh, it you know it was still a you know, great experience and. Uh, so after your time with the fire department, I know you had another little career. Why don't yep. you tell us about that? Yes, I, uh, Brother Hayes Keeling owned Down River Building Supplies. And uh, a member of Durban Lodge. And uh, his bookkeeper passed away. And uh, through the college classes I had had, I had accounting classes. And 
I went up to talk to him, and he says, well, let's give it a try. And uh, I, uh, back at that time, this was, uh, you know, where it was all the ledger system with, with carbon paper and, mm -hmm. and carbonless paper, and you did the, you know, three, you know, three different copies at once. So when you were done, your, your bills and your credits and your, and your credit, credit debits and, and everything had to balance out at the end of the month. Well, the end of the first month, I, they showed me how to do it, and, and I totaled everything up, and I balanced to the penny. Jeez. During the, during the years that I worked for them, there was only two times that I was off. I was off by one penny once, and it's off exactly by $100 once. But it was in our favor. And he said, don't even look for it. We'll find it when we're not expecting it. So when you, you, know, when you figure you have, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in sales for a month and you balance the penny, he says, don't anybody else touch those books. But that kind of tied me down to where I had to, had to be there every day and take care of the postings. But uh, How long did you do that? Off and on for about uh, see, eight years, okay. nine years. Very good. So, excluding the Masonic fraternity, were you a member of any other clubs or associations or organizations? I was uh, a member of Taylor Moose Lodge. Okay. Uh, because my uncle Ira was a uh, received the Pilgrim degree, which is equal to our thirty third, and uh, he was very active in the in the uh, Moose Lodge, and he was one of the founding founding members of the Taylor Moose Lodge, and. Uh, because he didn't have any sons, he would always take me to the father and son uh, festivities at the you know, dinners at the at the lodge, and uh, so uh, he would take me fishing with him, and and so uh, he was you know very uh, very uh, nice experience with my uncle. Uh, you know, I I just uh, didn't look. I didn't. Yeah, I looked at him as you know my favorite at the time, and. Uh, because, uh, you know, my dad was my dad, but, you know, with him I had to work. <laughs> with my uncle, it was a yeah, have some different fun. story. So, uh, how is Moose similar to the masonry, and how is it different? Um, it has its good points, and uh, it doesn't have the, uh, the rigors of, of the uh, present, present, you know, presentation of the degrees. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it's red out of all the books, um, whereas, you know, we were always taught to memorize our degree work, and uh, there's no, uh, no, you know, back when I joined, it was, you had to give your proficiency, and uh, with the moose, you could just take an obligation, and you're a member. Uh, I, uh, I'm not an active member now, because uh, I just didn't, uh, uh, didn't see the the drinking aspect of of the moose as being something that I wanted to be wanted to be around that much. Okay. So, how did you first learn of the Masonic fraternity? Well, my uncle Ira was a Mason. My dad was a Mason. My uncle Richard, Uncle Leonard, Uncle James were all Masons. Were they Michigan Masons? They were Indiana Masons. Okay. My, my dad and my uncle were Michigan Masons. Okay. My uh, my uncle Leonard, Uncle Richard, and Uncle James were, were my dad's brothers, and they were Indiana Masons. And uh, Uncle Leonard was a past master of uh, Moore Lodge in Odin, Indiana, and Uncle James was a past master of Plainville Lodge in Plainville, Indiana, which are neighboring towns. And uh, but I, I, you know, I wanted to join the Masons, and uh, I mentioned different things to my dad. And, he would never, never budge and say anything to me. But when I was in the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant Harrington McMurphy, great guy, always treated me with just, you know, just like a, like, just like I was as one of his kids, you know. And uh, he had a Masonic ring on. And I says, Chief, I notice you have a Masonic ring on. How do you join that organization? He says, Are you asking? And I says, Yeah. He says. You ask, and you just did. So I'll be back to see you in a little bit. Within the hour, he was there and gave me a petition, and I petitioned Bethel Lodge in Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, went, rode the bus to town, 
to uh, for the uh, interview and uh, the lookout committee and took my uh, first two degrees in 1974 and took my entered apprentice degree and then took my uh, fellow craft degree and uh, then I got discharged and came to came back home and took my third degree as a courtesy to Bethel Lodge in Golden Ark. And my dad belonged to Lincoln Park at the time, but he wasn't active. My uncle was a charter member of, of Golden Ark. So I joined Golden Ark because it was the Taylor Lodge. And uh, I uh, immediately became active, uh, appointed a steward the first year in 65. And uh, then in 66, I was appointed steward and the secretary was never there, and so I was acting as uh, assistant secretary. In 67 through 73, uh, 72, I was uh, elected secretary, and then I started in, in the line in 73 and became master in 77 of Golden Ark. So <clears throat> tell us about some of your memories of being master of the lodge. What sticks out in your mind? that year? Um, learning to organize and, and uh, also uh, learning to delegate was, was uh, key things that I had learned uh, previously through the, through the uh, my service year, a uh, time with the Air Force. And uh, you, you can't do it all yourself. You have to have a team. You have to have cooperation. And without that, without that team effort, um, you you can only do so much with your, your yourself, and uh, so you, you you learn to delegate and and watch from a, from a distance to see that things get done, and things you know are prosperous. But you also have to go back to those people, and give them a pat on the back for a job well done, because if they do that job, and they don't get the, the uh, pat on the back, then they they you know. They have the feeling many times that, uh, you know, nobody notices. Mm -hmm. And it's not me. You know, as master, I take, I take the bows for, for a successful year. But it's, I don't do all that work. Without that teamwork and effort, it, 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 uh, it's just impossible for one person to do everything. You also served many years as secretary of your lodge. Tell us about that experience. I to totally, I, I served 24 years, and uh, there again, you have you have strong masters, and you have weak masters, and as secretary, you're in a position uh, with after you, after you garner the, the experience of, of the lodge and how it runs and and uh, how how to do this and how to do that. If you don't pass that along, you're not being you're not being a good secretary. Uh, Secretaries uh, uh, are there to assist, uh, in my estimation, they are there to, to be the, uh, the reminder to the master that, hey, we need to do this, and here's how you do it. Uh, even if you have to write letters yourself and just have him sign them, uh, which I've done on numerous occasions. I taught many, many masters of the lodge to, to go, you know, Go into the end of your year as master with the idea that you are there as as the aid to that to that master. Uh, I many years masters come in and I says I told them I said you know try to involve as many of the past masters as you can through committee appointments or whatever, and by giving them a part after their year is gone, you get them coming back. And, and you know, inputting into the lodge uh, their experiences, and and you know with that with that input and with that camaraderie, uh, you get a lot better, a lot better results. So, <clears throat> having done that job for twenty four years, you obviously enjoyed it a lot. What was the best part about being secretary? Oh, geez, just the overwhelming experience of of meeting. Meeting people and and, and uh, you know just trying to make sure that that everything went uh, went according to you know the way it should, 
and also by being able to oversee what was going on and making sure that they didn't deviate for, uh, one way or the other from, from what was right and proper. So as an assistant, yeah, that's good. You belong to, I know, several appendant and affiliated organizations. Tell us some of the appendant bodies you belong to. Well, I, uh, one of the first that I joined was Eastern Star because Art and Bessie Jones, uh, Art was a charter member of Golden Ark, and his wife, Bessie, was uh, active with Eastern Star. Well, they never had any children. And uh, with me being secretary, she, she twisted my arm, and, and uh, I, I joined the Eastern Star because I, I, I love the people dearly. It just, you know, it's like another set of parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to help her with her projects as, as a worthy matron, and, and, uh, but I also traveled with her. Because there was, you know, back at that time, the Eastern Star Temple was downtown, and she didn't want to go down there by herself, and she didn't want to go here or there by herself, and her husband didn't want to go. So I, used to, I would travel with her and, and drive her around to different functions, and uh, and uh, then she became good friends with, with Gail and I both, and uh, we would go over there and play cards and different things. That was the first one, and then I, a lot of the members uh, or a lot of the honorary members of, of Golden Ark were were the the uh, more or less the helpers of getting Golden Ark on its feet, and uh, they were a lot of members from Loyalty Lodge, and and uh, they had made them honorary members, and uh, I can remember when I first joined the the Masons, seeing the Knight Templar Honor Guard, and I thought, wow, you know, just. And it you know, puts, kind of puts you in awe when you see the, 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 you know, the attire and the, the swords and the chapeaus. And, and uh, it just you know, it makes, a, makes a real mark in your mind, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, how regal that they, they, they appear. And uh, so I uh, started out by joining the chapter, and then I joined the commandery. At the time I joined, I joined... Highland Park Commandery. And then, uh, I think it was early 70s, uh, they sold Highland Park Masonic Temple. And uh, I, uh, my commandery moved to Mount Clemens. And so I ended up transferring my membership to Detroit Commandery number one. And so I belonged, transferred my membership in the chapter because uh, loyalty chapter was no more. And uh, so I transferred my membership to Monroe cha Chapter, and then uh, which is also downtown. Which is also downtown, and uh, then I backed up and joined Monroe Council, and uh, then from there I uh, joined the uh, 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 York Wright College, and uh, also in the Detroit Temple, and, uh, and then I joined the Shrine. And I can remember being in the George Bobbish class of 1970 in the Shrine. And then in 71, I says, geez, I've completed all the York Wright degrees. Uh, I went back and, and uh, joined Scottish Rite in 1971. And uh, I uh, enjoyed the, I enjoyed both, both uh, rights and uh, I, uh, wasn't able to participate as much in York Right as I was, you know, I got involved with Scottish Right and was uh, on the uh, membership development committee for a good number of years and uh, uh, enjoyed that. And uh, being secretary of the lodge, you're in a key position to uh, encourage people to join the Scottish Right, York Right, whatever they ask about, and, uh, you know, kind of encourage them to, to join Scottish Right, which I did. And uh, I... I think I had something like 95 petitions I had signed. Wow! And uh, with the with the Scottish Rite and Shrine, but I wouldn't simply sign their petition and just let them on their own. I would make sure that when they wanted to join, we made arrangements, and I picked up everybody and I took them to the meetings. I took them to their degrees. I took, brought them home. And that you know, to me, is is, is you know, going the extra mile because you know because you care, because you have it you have it here in your heart. And uh, then I joined uh, the Grotto at one point. I, 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 dropped, I have no longer a member of Grotto now. They, they lost, they sold their building and uh, 
but uh, I, uh, let's see, was also uh, uh, received awards in, in the various youth groups. Uh, but, uh, well, let, let's talk about that. I, I know that you've received many honors and awards. What are some of the more memorable or the ones that, they all mean something to you, but what ones are the most special? I would have to say the, uh, uh, when I went to Grand Rapids for the uh, DMLA. Legion of Honor? Legion of Honor. Yeah, that was, that was very meaningful, and as well as the, uh, the Rainbow and, and, and Job's, but uh, probably, probably mostly the, the DMLA. Okay, very good. Um, tell us about some of the, the older past Grand Masters that you knew personally, be, like before your time in line, some of the guys that you had known. Oh, geez. Um, well, Glenn Alt was Grand Secretary, I believe. You know, when, when I joined, he, was, he, was, he had to be uh, Grand Secretary, I believe. And he was the, I believe, I believe the signing Grand Master of our charter. Oh, okay. So I got to, you know, I got to, you know, speaking with him on a regular basis, and uh, he gave me a lot of information. And uh, he uh, was supposed to come out and be on my installing team in '77 when I, when I was, was or '76 for '77, and uh, that evening he had an accident and passed away shortly after that. So needless to say, he didn't make it to the installation, and uh, I. Uh, yeah, very, 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 uh, very, very difficult loss. But uh, John Polson uh, just uh, had had I had you know experience with me with him and uh, uh, very, uh, you know, very nice, nice person. And, and uh, I found you know, Bob Osborne, uh, just so many of the past grandmasters that you uh, you 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 learn to you, know, you talk to them and you meet them and. Uh, but uh, it just, you know, very, uh, very enlightening. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your Masonic mentors, both in your lodge and as you went through Grand Lodge? Who were some of your mentors? Well, some of my mentors. I'd have to say uh, Jim Garrison. Uh, Jim was a past master of our lodge in 1974. So I would have been his... Uh, I've been his senior deacon, and uh, he uh, he had a way about him that just you know, just he had one son, and uh, Harold, and Harold is a past master of a lodge now in Washington State, and uh, yeah, but Harold and I were like like brothers for a while because uh, Jim Jim and Virginia Garrison lived a half mile from me, and uh, uh, before him was uh, Paul Miller. Uh, Paul Miller was friends with my dad, when worked with my dad at McLeod Steel, and then he became a member of, of uh, Golden Arc Lodge and eventually became treasurer of the lodge, and uh, spent a lot of time with Paul Miller and, and uh, just you know, just great people, just really absolutely sincere, good people. Very good. And during my years as Grand Master, I had I had a great mentor. And I'm talking to him now. Oh, well, thank you. When uh, you decided to run for Grand Lodge, what, what went into your thoughts? Why did you decide that you thought you needed to do that or wanted to do that? Well, I felt I wanted to do that because uh, I, I, I felt with the experience that I had, with all the all the years of, of sec, being secretary, and 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 at that time I also had uh, be, became a past most wise master in Scottish Rite in, in chapter, and and uh, uh, you know with all with all I had to all the knowledge I had to to give, I, I wanted to I wanted to be able to to, to be a, a, a larger part of what masonry is all about, and I felt I could give back to those in the Grand Lodge and, and be, be a meaningful, uh, make a difference. I wanted to make a difference and, and, and uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, further masonry. You were elected in uh, 2001 
And as you progress through the Grand Lodge line, and, and even upon becoming Grand Master, what were some of the things that surprised you? The things that surprised me was the, was the, uh, requ not requ well, the request, the requirements of, of a Grand Lodge officer. I never realized until I got involved how, how you know, time consuming and, and, and uh, you know, every aspect, uh, physical labor and, as well as, as the driving, the driving and driving. You know, I wore out three cars during my, you know, during my, my seven years. Uh, it, it just, you know, to the, to the person, to the regular member who don't realize all that go, goes into being a Grand Lodge officer, you'd think, well, you know, nothing to it. But there is a lot more to it than, than what meets, the, meets most people's eyes. And uh, once you get involved and uh, uh, I'm going to do the job, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, make a difference. I'm going to do what, what and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And that's, you know, that's the way I looked at things. And uh, it, it just, uh, I never realized before that, though, how much actually it was required of, of a grand officer in, in uh, doing the job to its, to its full potential. It is a huge commitment. So you progressed, you became Grand Master. Um, what were a couple of the highlights of that year? Highlights of my year as Grand Master, uh, I'd have to say the, the biggest, well, it wasn't only being Grand Master, it was when I came off the stage after being, being elected, I had a young man come up to me and he shook my hand and he says, you don't remember me, do you? I says, I do, but I said, I can't place where. I said, when you figure all the people you meet. Mm -hmm. And he says, you came to Petoskey. And I was coming up the stairs, and you gave me one of the Grand Master's pins. Now, that was like two or three years before. And he says, well, I'm not old enough. And I said, well, you will be someday. And I said, when that day comes, talk to your dad about it. And he remembered that. And he was, his dad was having a little trouble with him at the time. And his dad had pulled me aside after I gave him the pen and told me, he said, you know, I don't know if you should have given it to him. He's only 17 and he's given me a lot of trouble. Well, that doing that and me, that made such an Im impact on that young man that he completely changed and his dad says, I don't know what you said to him that day, but he changed in, 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 his, in his behavior, in his attitude, everything. And that young man wanted to be there that day to shake my hand because he had joined his dad's lodge and had, had just, in, in, in just in, embarked on a, on, a new, on a new life for himself and a, and a great experience with him and his dad. And you know, that just, you know, just stands out in my mind. Not that I was Grand Master at the time, but, but, but that, that attitude uh, of, of taking to heart what Masonry teaches and, and living it and making a whole new experience with, between him and, him and his father and, and entering a new life, basically, for that young man. But during my year as Grand Master, I, I just have to say all the... Uh, all the dinners and all the all the awards and all all the different things that you you receive as grandmaster, but I go back to the same thing I said before. Without without the teamwork and the team effort, you 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 know you can't do it all. And you delegate uh, when you can. And I even had I even had a request during my year from a from a member who wanted me to come and and be at his wedding. And take a take a part in his wedding, and I said, "What am I going to do? I can't marry him, you know. I, I'm not a minister." And uh, so I was same the same day we had something going on somewhere else, and I you know, had to had to regretfully decline. But uh, it just uh, you know when you're when you're uh, a new member, you you look uh, with uh, with awe at the. Uh, 
and the different different people involved, and, and uh, you you know, basically, I think you know you you should be there to make a positive impression on the minds of those people, and and make them want to be uh, a better person themselves. Very good. So, what do you think the fraternity needs to do to grow and prosper? Communication. Communication with the uh, with the new members uh, in all aspects, and uh, to to uh, tell the story of what what Masons have done and what they can do for for individuals. And it's not just you know what am I going to get out of it. What I'm saying is is what what you can give to someone and where they can feel it here, whether it's uh, putting on. Uh, uh, a Masonic memorial service for for a deceased member, and going to the family and and you know telling them from your heart, you know, the, the the significant loss that you feel for their loved one. I've had people come to me after funerals and say, "How do I join this organization?" Because of us being there. But there again, communication is key. In in that new member, but it also is with with members in general. I've highly encouraged and pushed uh, different lodges to, to either have a call tree or have a phone system, the, 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 the new phone uh, call uh, system that they have now where you know, it's not really expensive and it's, you know, it will call the membership that want to be called and give them a reminder. You know, we have a function today, we have a dinner, we have a meeting, whatever that, that be. And, and But you know, keep that communication going. The member who receives a monthly letter and never receives a communication on the phone is very likely to say, what am I getting out of this? And without that communication, it's just, it, it just, you know, email does, I mean, to me, an email doesn't get it. And what would you um, tell a young man that came to you and said, I'm thinking about joining the Masonic fraternity, what advice would you give him? I would, I would advise him to get a couple three by five cards and carry them in his pocket with a pen and any question in his mind that came up that he wanted answered, to write it down and either call me or come and see me and we'll sit down and talk. And let him be satisfied within his mind and heart that that this is, you know, because everyone's going to have questions. And many times I've seen where somebody who was very enthused about uh, joining the lodge had a young man come to me and, and uh, his grandfather was a charter member of Golden Ark Lodge. And his name was Jordan. And uh, he was, he just, come over and hung out at my house every day and he said, can I, can I study over at your house? He said, it's, it's, it's mass confusion at mine. Oh, well, there's only Gail and I there, so sure, come on over. And he would, you know, he'd read it, he'd, he'd study, work on my computer, you know, and uh, he asked me about his, his grandfather's Masonic ring and so on and so forth. And uh, He uh, joined and then went to a church retreat and the church talked him out of it. And uh, I had talked to him about that before and he, he says, well, that's no problem with the church. Well, it was a problem because he was active with his church and his church was against masonry. So these things need to come out and those questions answered in, a, you know, in, a, in advance of them joining the lodge because you know, we don't want to stand in the way of, any, of anyone's church or their belief in God. Those kind of things need to be addressed, but also communication, full communication with members as well as aspirants. Along those same lines, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that was going to become Worshipful Master of their Lodge for the first time? I have had that, and uh, as I previously said, involvement with everyone that you can to come back to Lodge. If you get a master who goes out of office 
I can remember distinctly, we had a member in, or a past master in 1997, I think it was 97, who was when he went out of office, he says, geez, I never realized the empty, useless feeling that you have when you're, when you're finished with your, your year. And I felt that way myself after becoming Grand Master. I felt, geez, I, you know, but the phone calls stop, the mail stops, the, uh, the emails stop. Uh, geez, all of a sudden you're nobody. And uh, it, has a, it has a big, uh, it's a big, big thing to, to get over. I agree. To get through, you know. But, uh, so, actually following that same track again, what advice would you give somebody that came to you and said, I'm thinking about running for Grand Lodge office? There again, uh, they have to, they have to uh, do a lot, of, a lot of footwork. They have to let people know who they are and what they, what they have to offer the Grand Lodge. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of uh, do they, you know, do they have the uh, intestinal fortitude? Do they have the knowledge and do they have the uh, abilities to uh, uh, not only financial and, and, you know, time, but, uh, uh, is, you know, if a person's married, is his wife in favor of, uh, of him being gone a lot? That they have to know those things well in advance, and uh, you know, and the costs also. And uh, you know, it's it's very important that they know those things in advance in order to to uh, you know, be braced for that. Uh, you don't want someone starting and then you know, dropping out after one year. That that uh, weakens the, the the Grand Lodge line. Same thing as as a lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, you you in a lodge you you go through and you all of a sudden you lose your senior deacon or, or your uh, a warden. It's, it's, that's just that really puts a hole in the line. And if you know if you don't have someone either to fill in there to to patch the 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 the, the fabric of who that you know, the, the the work ethic of that lodge, it. Uh, it's just difficult to overcome that. How has masonry impacted your life? Well, I have to say that uh, I, 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 you know, it's it's allowed me to uh, to experience the, uh, the the greatness of of uh, of personal involvement with people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, you know, where, where people have had a loss uh, in their family or whether people are just having uh, personal issues in their life. At one time I was, I had, uh, let's see, well, I had a young, uh, young officer from Sparta, Michigan, who, who was emailing and calling me and, and uh, wasn't sure if he wanted to continue as a, as a mason, and uh, I talked with him and, and uh, worked with him and and uh, ended up going up and finally install and helping install him as master. And uh, last I heard, he's still a member. Uh, that's one example. I had another another young man who uh, was adopted when he was when he was younger and. Uh, He's the only child that his parents have, but uh, he didn't feel the connection there with his with his parents. And uh, that young man uh, would call me uh, two or three times a week, and we would just talk on the phone, taking the time to be there for people. And another young man from Dearborn, uh, I think he was a member of Olive Branch Lodge, and uh, worked odd shifts. You know, he'd call me at two o'clock in the morning. He was having problems, you know, emotionally, and, and uh, he uh, called me and talked to me, and I talked to him until he was ready to quit talking. And uh, in fact, I even went over to his house uh, at one point and uh, uh, picked up his computer and took it into the computer shop for him, and and because uh, he didn't, he, one of the things he had had, he had lost his driver's license and uh, for drinking, and uh, but. Uh, he just needed someone to talk to, and he couldn't relate to his dad. And uh, I, I, you know, 
So it's being able to have an impact on people's lives and then yes, having an impact much. on yours. Very much. Any final reflections on the fraternity? Anything you'd like to add? I've seen the fraternity change a lot through the years. We have to change to a certain degree, but I, I, uh, uh, I would like to see us get back to uh, get back to, to re really where they where it, where it was here within a man's heart. That's where everything starts, and that's where it should be. Instead of just being, a, oh, I belong to the Masons. I want you know, being a Mason, I think you know, should be heartfelt and revered. And I don't see that in today's in today's uh, 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 society, as well as as the Masonic fraternity, or or my church. You know, it, it just you know, you don't I don't see the dedication and the sincerity that, that we once see. But I think that's societal, uh, you know more than anything. I understand. Well, Most Worshipful Brother Ira, we'd like to thank you for being with us today and uh, participating in our Legacy Series. And thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to be here.